VA Health and Benefits, official mobile app for VA Health and Benefits. VA's official mobile app is a smarter, more convenient way for veterans to manage and carry their VA Health and Benefits information. One veteran notes, I went into my local hardware store and logged into my VA mobile app. A quick glance at my phone showed them I was a veteran and I was able to get the veteran discount without any paperwork. It was easy and convenient. Download the app via the Apple Store at https colon forward slash forward slash apple dot co forward slash three uppercase j lowercase b lowercase k nine uppercase o lowercase l or download the app via the Google Play Store at https colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash 3 uppercase q 5 lowercase q 9 uppercase l 5Welcome again to Oscar Mike Radio. My name is Travis. I'm the host. Oscar Mike Radio is part of the Hubuzu Network. You can find out more on hubuzu.com. I want to thank my sponsors, Joyce Asek of Asek Real Estate, Army National Guard veteran Mark Holmes of Reapers Detailing and Power Washing, and my veteran-owned business supporters, Sipper Savage Salad Dressing, Bottom Gun Coffee, and Quezon Shaving Company. And I'm excited. You know, I... I, I have started off 2023 with a bang. The army is figuring really heavy into it. And I'm on my, you know, the gram and Sean Ambrose hits me up. I read his book, Ghosts in the Valley, about a year and a half ago. And when a first sergeant says jump, I don't care if you're out or not, you say how high. First Sergeant Ambrose, welcome to Oscar Mike Radio. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you having me. This is really cool. Like I, I, I read Ghosts in the Valley and at first is like, what's an MP going to tell me that I don't already know? I mean, MPs are MPs. They just stand at the gate, bust your balls and give you hassles all day long. That's what they do. You know, <laughs> I mean, any PSC with a badge up to a major with a badge is just bad news. But I, I, I read your book and, and got a very different viewpoint on what the, what the military police actually do, one. And then two, you know, how you develop someone as a leader in the Army. Uh, there are similarities between the Marine Corps and the Army, but but you had a very interesting leadership journey. So the, for the folks out there who don't know who Sean is, kind of just tell us your background a little bit and how you got into the Army, please. Uh, yeah, so I've, I've been in, it'll be 15 years next month. Um <clears throat> came in from uh, Los Angeles, California. It's just something I've always wanted to do. Uh, my grandfather served in Korea, um, but that was about the extent of service in my family. I always played soldier in the backyard. I always enjoyed it. So it's something I've, I've always wanted to do. I just didn't know what that meant. And originally I joined those just do five years and then get out and then go back to LA and work LAPD, do that typical route. But, um, you know, people that I met, the uh, the path uh, of my career that, that paved its way through, through the deployments. It's just something that I found myself very interested in and um, enjoyed, you know, putting on the uniform every day that I just decided to re-enlist and re-enlist. And, you know, here I am now, almost 15 years later. 15 years. Does it, does it go by quick or did, it, did some parts yeah. of your service seem to drag on? No, it go, it's going by super fast. Uh, sometimes I can't believe how old I am. And, but, uh, yeah, man, it's it's going by super quick. So let's talk a little bit about Ghost in the Valley. That's when I pick up your story, and you were a sergeant, um, you know, kind of going to a new unit and new responsibilities. And it seemed to mark not only a turning point in your Army career, but also in your personal life with some things you had going on. You know, mm -hmm. what what was what was Sean like at that time? Uh, well, uh, so I spent my first six years at Fort Carson. Um, I deployed as a PFC and then, uh, the second time as a sergeant. Um, 
man, I, uh, I'd like to think that I'm the same person as far as my character, how I, how I carry myself, how I treat people, my, um, how I view things in some ways. I've always kind of stayed true and the same, but uh, definitely was a really, really immature uh, in my way of thinking. And um, I, yeah, I had a lot of room to grow. Uh, and, and thankfully, Fort Carson and those deployments helped push me in that, you know, essentially what I needed in my life at that time. A lot of Ghosts in the Valley is talking about Afghanistan and the challenges you faced over there. And I, I guess kind of going, you know, from recent events backwards, you know, what was it like watching the withdrawal from Afghanistan? I mean, it, it, as much as you can talk about. Uh, yeah, it was, it was surreal. It was hard to, it was hard to watch. Um, it didn't feel real. I, it almost felt like we were going to be there forever. And um, some of those events were historic, man. Some of those images, the Marines, the people on the planes. I mean, it just, it, the chaos and uh, that was displayed that we saw in the media, you know, was a perfect visual representation of what it was like being there every, every day, every year, um, day in, day out. It's just complete chaos. Um, sometimes more structured chaos than others, but uh it was hard to watch it. Um, it felt like an end of an era. It felt like we still had more to give and, uh, it just kind of felt like the wounds weren't ready to heal. And we kind of ripped that bandaid off too soon. Well, one of the things that I kind of want to, you know, get some perspective on first sergeant is countries, armies have been trying to, for lack of a better term, take over Afghanistan, for thousands of years, all the way back to Alexander the Great, you know, and before him till, you know, the, the Russians before us and now us, what, what is it about that part of the world or that country that, that makes it a, a I don't know, like a magnet for conflict? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I was always told I'd try to, at that age, my point in my career, I try to stay out of the strategic overall vision. I wasn't mature enough to understand those reasons, but, you know, to my understanding, it is just the resources that are there, the area um, and where it's at in Asia, um, just the placement of it all. Uh, and like I said, the resources uh, that it provides, uh, it's such a beautiful country. Um, what Afghanistan could provide if it if given the right opportunity can blossom into a great country. It's just too bad that, uh, you know, they're ridden with you know, these, these terrorist organizations that, um, you know, that, that hold it down um, and continue to, to hold it down. You, you leave Afghanistan and come back to the United States, you know, uh, after you've been there. We'll go back to the book a little bit later, but, you know, what was it like leaving Afghanistan and coming back and staying in the Army? Uh, it felt un incomplete. I felt like I still had more to give. I, I wanted to continue to go back and volunteer. Um, it just the rotations of going, coming back, going, coming back. It just felt normal. It felt like what needed to be done at that time in the army. And, and especially as I'm older, even though I know it's not my place anymore, I'm, I'm not a door kicker. Uh, that's not what I'll do. I still, you know, the more you progress in rank as the years go on, you know, it's very depressing because you start to realize that you're everything but a soldier. Um, you, the further in rank you go, the further away in which the reasons and why you joined the army, the, why you walked into the recruiting office um, to, to go be a door kicker, to kick it with the boys and, and do all that fun stuff that you see on TV. Um, those, do, those days are, are dead and gone. And uh, you try to hold on to them as much as you can, but you know, you can't. Um, so it's, it's been, it's been difficult uh, coming back from Afghanistan and, and as the years have progressed, but you know, you try to hold on to that peace in the past. You know, that's something that, you know, you bring up that I remember our, our, our first sergeants very rarely ever came out to the field to see what we did. They were always at what we called the head shed and, you know, you didn't want to go up there. Um, you know, as you progress now, you are a first sergeant, you are taking care of a lot of soldiers underneath of you. How, how does leadership change from E5 to E8? Is it just more of it or is, um, is there more involved? more involved I've had to learn over the past two years as a first sergeant that uh, 
uh, understanding the organization as a whole um, and learning how to take accountability for other people's actions, accountability when things fail to happen, regardless if you had any part of it or not. Um, trying to, instead of burn someone, instead of removing someone from a position, instead of, you know, uh, so something bad happens, be so reactive, learning to, you know, unless someone died or something serious happened, use it as a teaching point, mentor the next generation as much as possible. Um, it, it just, it's increased at a grander scale. And, and, you know, I'm no longer training soldiers. Uh, I'm mentoring the future leaders. Um, and it grows as I mentor these young staff sergeants and sergeant first classes. Um, which is also, it's, it keeps me on my toes. It, it ensures that my leadership style and my leadership education um, and qualities are, are ever changing, um, which, you know, is good for me as well. So um, it's definitely had its own challenges though. It's, it's not the, it's not direct level leadership anymore as a Sergeant. Going back to being a Sergeant, that's kind of, if, if I remember correctly, and I, and I brush up on the book, because like I said, I read it like a year and a half ago completely. It, it kind of starts you as your sergeant and you're going to a new unit and you're being evaluated not only as a door kicker, but can you write reports? Can you do small leadership exercises? So on and so forth. Um, what prompted you to start Ghost in the Valley there? Um, you talking about like when I actually published the book and stuff? Right, right, right. Um, well, I, I wrote, I started writing the book at the end of 2019, um, when I got here to Fort Leonard Wood, uh, as an instructor and, uh, as an instructor, it was the first time I didn't have soldiers underneath me. It was the first time I wasn't getting late night phone calls, going to the field, doing all that stuff. And so, um, I found out that my PTSD was starting to evolve for, in the situation I was in and, uh, you know, being in all these jobs after deployment, going to the field, NTC rotations and stuff. Um, always kind of kept my mind busy, uh, you know, training soldiers nonstop, working seven days a week, um, that when I became an instructor and I had the weekends off and I could keep my phone on vibrate for two years straight, um, I started to watch my PTSD evolve because I had a lot more time to myself and, and, didn't, and that, you know, happening left me with more thoughts to myself or reopening doors I had opened quite some time. I wasn't ready to open. And so, um, I, sat down and I tried to put my thoughts on paper um, and it was never set out and write a book. I just kind of did a chronological order and started putting my thoughts on paper, how I felt talking about some of the major events, what I was thinking in that moment kind of thing, try to revisit, try to heal my own way. And then somebody picked it up and said, man, you should make this into a book. And um, I kind of took it as a compliment. I didn't really want the exposure, but uh, you know, I, I realized that I could hopefully use it as a platform to help people who've experienced trauma and at the same time, um, bring uh, knowledge and awareness to a foundation that was built for my lieutenant, uh, get resources out there for veterans, uh, and just kind of be a voice for, you know, regular operational conventional soldiers like myself. You know, so much we, we look at the special operations world because that's big and sexy. It's the movie deals and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there's more of us uh, organizational, operational, regular conventional dudes that uh, have experienced quite a bit of combat and sometimes get forgotten about um, because we, we do a lot of the dirty work and uh, it gets brushed over. And, and I wanted to be a voice for those individuals. Well, that's what I got out of the book. Uh, you know, you talk about a lot of the behind the scenes things that, like you said, never see light of day. And you talked about your PT. It was easy to understand, you know, why someone in your situation maybe wouldn't experience PTSD and then, when there's nothing to occupy yourself, like you said, those those ghosts, for lack of a better term, come back and start haunting you. I thought that was articulated real well in the book. Did you did you set out to do that, or is that just how you felt? Yeah, that's just how I felt. Yeah, and, and you've also experienced some some physical trauma throughout all this time, and you're still serving. How is that? Yeah, uh, it's it's taken a beating on me. Um, you know, my body is, is aged like dog years. It's, uh, you know, I, I've gotten shit from head to toe. I've TBI, I've been blown up, shrapnel to my left side of my face, uh, shrapnel to my right shoulder. Um, I just had spinal surgery in my lower back, uh, torn both of my uh, hip flexors, tore my right knee surgery, right foot surgery, right ankle surgery. Um, I've had 31 procedures since being in service. Um, and uh, it, it's very difficult to, to have to reset the body 
and get back in the fight and still lead soldiers. It's been very challenging um, to, to stay healthy. It, it's a young man's game, and I'm not a young man no more. So. Well, I got to say this. I, I, 20 years later, something that happened to me in the Marine Corps, uh, that, that check came due, and it was a pretty big wake-up call. And, and I understand what it's like trying to get back to to uh, shape, but you're told you're never going to be right ever again. It's 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 a mental thing you – really have to work hard to overcome. Yeah, it really is. So you go through all these things and, and you're on my show and, and, you know, you talked about how you want to use your story to help others. So what is it about your story you think that offers help to others? Uh, just the simple fact that it's trauma. Um, I try to preach to my soldiers, these younger soldiers, deployments of feet, you know, phased out and, and the, uh, and combat veterans are starting to get out of the army and we're starting to see the military reset. Um, you know, I try to teach the next generation. Uh, luckily I had leaders that did this for me where they explained their trauma. They let me know what did or didn't work for them. They were very open about their experiences. And I think that's, you know, how we share our experiences with the next generation. That's how we learn. That's how we grow uh, instead of just repeating the same failures. And, um, you know, I just try to preach that trauma is trauma. Uh, it can be a car accident, a rape, uh, you know, a domestic violence. It doesn't matter. Trauma is trauma. You don't need to drag a body across the, the battlefield um, or, or work on a casualty um, in, in order to say that you've experienced that trauma um, and, and invalidate that, you know. Um, and so I, I try to explain that, like I said, conventional guy, organizational guy, just some brown dude from L.A., a normal average C student, growing up a fucking nobody if, if i can go through these traumatic experiences and, and and somehow come out on the other end and work through them then um hopefully i could be a voice for those who um or feel like they fit in that same category that uh that feel like an average joe that it's hard to validate their their trauma and uh and work through it um but it can't it's doable it can be done do you ever have soldiers who get out contact you and say hey you know what that lesson you imparted about that helped me out yeah i mean you never really know it's called a butterfly effect you never really know when you mentor when you teach someone uh and, and they they understand that lesson that you're teaching them it, it could be months weeks years down the road uh, and then something could happen to them and they'll remember that talk that you had and then they try to implement it themselves and they find it to be successful and they'll, you know, hit me up. They're like, man, I, I remember you told me this, blah, blah, blah. And they finally got to implement it because they're in a leadership position now uh, and see that it's effective and stuff. So, uh, and that's mentorship, that's leadership. So um, you hope that uh, your guidance will hopefully bloom into that butterfly effect, you, you know, down the road. The reason I ask is a lot of veterans get out and we lose that aspect of ourselves. And some of us have to get, reminders or a lot of reminders or you know even some are like hey i okay i got i got a situation right here here's what i do and i get through it but some forget it seems like do you i mean i've always wanted to ask you know why 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 do you think that is or do you have any experience in that no i i, I honestly i don't know yeah i, I haven't haven't had experience in that so you're teaching right now how do you like teaching? Is is it is it something that you enjoy doing? Is it is it is it cool when you see you know the younger soldiers, the light bulbs go on and start seeing them execute what you want them to execute? Because it's not really talked about a whole lot that somebody actually teaches, you know, junior soldiers how to be soldiers. Yeah, I mean, well, from, from my job right now, I don't get to teach as much as I I would like, but that's just based off my position. Um, so I'm in charge of a bunch of drill sergeants. Uh, I'm in charge of a basic training company. So we pick these kids up off the bus uh, as civilians and we transform them into MPs after 19 weeks. So, you know, it is very rewarding watching them, you know, not even know how to shave correctly and then leave here as young adults, you know, learning how to manage finances and, and relationships and, you know, um, start to work their way into this career field. It's, 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 it's nice to see. It's a different perspective. 
um, than like say a recruiter or a squad leader and stuff like that. Um, you're sending them out into the force. So it's, uh, it, it's definitely different. Um, but I'm, I'm super glad I got the experience to, to witness this. Through your journey and not only in your writing, but also recovering from your physical and, and mental trauma, have there been resources in and outside the army that have helped you? Uh, mostly in, I haven't, you know, the only thing out is uh, working with a lot of veterans that uh, I've served with or that are no longer in service that, you know, need someone to talk to, or I need someone to talk to. But as far as in the, you know, I try to take advantage of in, in the military resources, whether that be behavioral health or our pr brigade provider and stuff like that. I try to sit down and talk to them and decompress whenever I start to feel like my anxiety is too bad and stuff. So uh, I try to use, the, you know, like I said, Army's resources for what we got. You, do you ever feel that you might write another book, uh, you know, about uh, the different stages of your, your career after Ghost in the Valley? No, I, I think that's it for me. I think uh, yeah. the one and done. Um, and uh, I don't think there's much else I can say or teach from, you know, essentially the two and a half years ago when I, when I published it. Um, I think most of my life lessons came from when I was younger. Um, right now I'm just kind of riding on those and, and just doing these daily jobs, teaching these younger soldiers to do that. Um, but really, when I, I had to learn a lot of hard lessons when I was younger. So, Well, first, Sergeant, some of us learn lessons and need, like, constant lessons before it yeah. sticks. I mean, it's just the yeah. way some guys are, right? I mean, um, yeah. yeah, it takes some, some longer than others. So now that you've progressed through the, your younger years and you're, you're, you're doing this, you, you know, has your perspective changed on – you know, what you learned growing up. I mean, when I say growing up is there's, there's a maturity process throughout your enlistment that you had to do. Maybe you didn't consciously recognize it, but it did happen. And now that you're, you're, you're the, you're the first sergeant or they still call them tops in the army. First sergeant. Uh, every once in a while, you're supposed to say first sergeant, but sometimes they call me, they don't bother me. I don't really care. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, you know, it... yeah. Okay. Things you know, change. Yeah, no, I got you. Um, yeah, I, uh, that's a good question. I, yeah, I mean, I had to kind of go through those things. The maturity level wasn't there when I was younger. I mean, there's not really anything that kind of pops out that makes me think like, um, you know, this is one big life lesson. But I just think just, just how I do everything in the military um, has really, um, has been a constant building, right? Uh, since I came in the military, the best metaphor I could describe is, is, you know, the army has told me like, Hey, I need you to build this brick wall. And I no one really showed me how I just kind of fucking put some bricks down and slab some stuff on there and try to build as best I can. And uh, I, I've learned over the years that uh, I need to stop focusing on trying to build the biggest and big greatest wall that there is. Um, and that I need to um, put uh, one brick and lay it as perfectly as a brick can be laid and focus on one brick at a time. And soon enough, you know, you, you'll have a wall. So you're building this wall now. What, what happens, what happens next after the wall is built? The metaphor, the, the wall being the metaphor for your army career. Uh, are, are you, are you going to stay in for your full 20? Are you going to get out? What do you, what do you, what are you thinking about right now? Um, so Right now, I'm I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at doing 20 years. Um, I'm at I'm about to hit 15, but I'm also dealing with these spinal issues, and uh, not sure what's really. I'm kind of like in this weird limbo thing where I'm working with doctors because I'm I'm not only having complications, but I'm just I'm still kind of in pain, and not sure if I'm going to be able to run like I used to. And, you know, that's obviously a key part in being a soldier is to pass these PT tests and stuff. So uh, I'm not really sure what's next uh, right now, but I'm, I'm doing everything I can to fight uh, as long as I can at a bare minimum 18 years before I could medically retire. Yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, we'll see. Any, any thoughts about what, I mean, I mean, I always ask this, but any thoughts about what you would do when you do retire, you know, out in the civilian world? <laughs> no, no, uh, no. Uh, so the deal was um, that my wife, if she followed me in my career, that uh, she could decide where we retire. Um, 
And so she doesn't really know where, where she wants to go. Um, you know, she likes Missouri, which is where I'm currently at. Um, she likes having land uh, to herself and, um, you know, being away from the big city. But I, I have no clue where I'm going to retire. Um, and uh, job-wise, I, I mean, this is all I know. So I, I don't really know what I'm going to get myself into when this is all said and done. Well, I mean, you got time to decide. I'm always curious. Some, some, some people I talk to who are active duty say the same thing. Like, look, I, I just, I don't know. Some people are yeah. like, Hey, I've got this idea. I'm going to go for it. And, I, and that's what I'm going to do. Uh, everybody's different. Mm-hmm. Everybody's different. First sergeant, as we wind this down, you know, I can tell you that, you know, I read your book and I learned a lot about what goes on in the mind of a soldier. I didn't serve in combat. So there's a lot, I just don't know. And I don't pretend to know, but mm-hmm. you know, I can tell you that, you know, I, I, I checked you out on, on your book and then on your gram and I'm like, okay, th- this is, this is the other side of the military. Like you said, that people don't see. And, you know, I think it's worth noting that, that people need to see more of what of stories like yours. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it means a lot. It, uh, this is a long journey uh, of exposure that I wasn't really ready for, but um, then I, I'm glad that I did so I could help out as many people as I can. So speaking of helping out, how can someone, if they want to check out your book or your story, get in contact uh, or, or, or join the ride, if you will? Uh, yeah, so they can go to my website, SeanTobiasAmbrose.com, or they can just go to Amazon, Ghost of the Valley. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's on Nook. It's on Kindle. It's on Audible. Um which uh, the audio book is actually pretty cool. It's dual narrated. So my publisher hired a guy that has a real sexy radio voice and he read the entire book. And, you know, as you're reading my physical book, there's a bunch of internal thoughts that I have with myself in, in the battles or in those moments or whenever I do say something, I actually went to a recording studio and recorded all those. So um, as the narrator is narrating the book and I actually say something to someone or I'm having those internal thoughts, um, I actually interject with my, you know, with my own voice. Oh, that's really cool. That's nice. All right. Well, I will have the links to all those in the Oscar Mike Rios show post. You can go and check them out. Check out the audio book. Check out his website and get the book. I thoroughly enjoyed it, not only just from the fact that it was a good military story, but also, you know, in the aspect that I, I learned something from it, uh, for certain. So I know you are, you know, wicked busy, as we say up here in New England and um, mission and flight and all that good stuff. So I just want to say thanks for coming on and talking with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I'm Travis Oscar Mike Radio. I'm on with First Sergeant Sean Ambrose from the U.S. Army. You can check out all his links in the show post. And we are out. Join us on National Wreaths Across America Day, December 16th, 2023. Each December on National Wreaths Across America Day, our mission to remember, honor, and teach is carried out by coordinating wreath laying ceremonies at Arlington National Cemetery, as well as more than 3,700 additional locations in all 50 states at sea and abroad. Join us by sponsoring a veteran's wreath at a cemetery near you, volunteering or donating to a local sponsor group. for listening and watching Oscar Mike Radio, where our active duty service members and veterans are in action and the mission is in flight. If you are a veteran or know a veteran who needs help, please dial 998 and press 1 for the Veterans Crisis Line.